Good morning and happy Halloween. I'm a pumpkin. You're a pumpkin. I'm a shepherd. <laughs> and we're this far apart, just in case the COVID police are watching. We are so glad that you're uh, joining us, whether it's Sunday morning or Monday or middle of the night or who knows when. Uh, we're so glad you joined us. Hillers United Church is in downtown Calgary. Got a banner out front says, wherever you are, wherever you're at, pumpkins and shepherds, welcome. There are uh, four core practices here. Hospitality. So uh, I didn't know he was going to throw it to me this quickly. <laughs> well, so what? Carry so on. hospitality. Uh, <laughs> this week, uh, we weren't able to actually have live from the loft, which is what we're going to do to actually welcome people into this space digitally. So uh, it's going to begin next week. Hold on. What is that? Live from the loft is Jesse Peters, our art, uh, music artist in residence, who's going to do live music from the loft. Uh, and it's going to be a conversation back and forth around what is this music? Why is this music? You can request music. Uh, wonderful thing. So meet us on our Facebook page at seven o'clock on Wednesday night. I just picked one. What did you? you did I'm not going to tell okay. you. <laughs> tell Jesse. Okay. okay. Five for fighting. Anyway. Okay. Superman. Carry so on. so anyway, it's 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 our part of how we're trying to step into the more connection, and this is our hospitality. So that's happening here. Good stuff. Okay, and um, we trust whether it's Sunday or whatever day of the week that you have a conversation uh, and food and fellowship around heroes and the hero journey. Who's the hero for you, by the way? Uh, talk about heroes. We began Spiritual Nurture on Monday night. Jane Croshaw and I and a gathering of over 50 folks online to engage in a conversation about the hero's journey. And I encourage you, you don't have to, if you missed the first one, come, to, come tonight or tomorrow night and join us, uh, go to hellhurstunited.life uh, to find out about this. What a great chance. I felt filled up by 710 because I just saw people I'd forgotten about who are part of our faith community, people in other parts of the country, so spiritual nurture. But there's also daily mindful mornings and there's a read it or not book club uh, on Thursday evenings. There's just so much going on. Uh, we trust you'll find your way. And some people say, I don't like Zoom. I don't like Zoom. I just don't like Zoom. I'm done with Zoom. I'm gonna challenge you to try because you know she what she tried and I was tried. there. I was there, and I, I, it was good. It was, it was, it was something that you know you can see, see all these faces, but it's what we have right now, and it's what we're putting our effort and, and joy into. So join us there. Just give us a try. I know you know. It's, you know what? Yeah. Spiritual nurture is about content, uh, connections, and community. And I guarantee you, over the evening, uh, you can do other things while you listen if you want. If you just want to listen in, but. Really engaging with other people about their story is really rich. And I, I invite you to the hero's journey on Monday evenings. Third, social justice. So we uh, we'll talk about anti-racism work that, that uh, Keith is going to talk about later. One of the things that we do here is outreach, our outreach program. And we're doing our renovation. And there's so much going on in the background with our renovation. So much. And I have to say a big, huge thank you to John, John Bueller and uh, Sheila Wacom McLean and, and uh, Dave Harker, who are all working on. There's a massive uh, financial shift with this because of all of the cargo trucks that are out, uh, cargo ships that are out in the sea and the supplies. And there's a lot of going on. But these people are working tirelessly just to, to figure this all out. So huge thank you to them. Well, even in the sanctuary, you can't really see it, but we've got a new um, sound desk back there that's been uh, built and raised up. And uh, Bob the Builder has made it look like it's 100 years old by fitting it in beautifully. There's Bob so Watts, much that Bob Watts, Bob Watts, Bob Watts, yeah. Bob the Builder, we call him, <laughs> uh, has been part of this, has been, has been Dave Harker and uh, all, a whole group of people. Um, we'll make sure you know who they are, uh, helping to make this space better with cameras that will be part of our online ministry forever now. And so we're glad about that. We also had some bad news this week or difficult news. Cheryl Millman, who's been heading up our congregational care, has needed to step back uh, right now. Uh, you know, if you remember last uh, December, had the death of us, uh, one of her grandchildren just after birth, stillborn birth. Uh, and then now another grandchild uh, has uh, terminal cancer. And we love uh, Cheryl and Daryl and their richness in our community. And they need to step back. And we're going to surround them with love and care through absolutely heartbreaking, I believe God's heartbreaking uh, news for them. So we know that some of you, our hearts are broken and had challenges. And we trust that, that you'll be cared for if you let us know, because we want to support you. Uh, what was the other one? Well, I just want to say about Cheryl, too. Yeah. Cheryl's done a tremendous job holding you and I up in this. She's it, amazing. It, it just absolutely surrounded us with love. And so this is a this is a, a really big 
heartbreak for us also. This is really hard. So yeah. uh, we, we are happy to have Robin Kidd step into this role uh, very graciously. And I met with her yesterday afternoon and we'll do a beautiful job handing off to make sure that the congregation is taken care of the way that we need to care for the congregation right now. So really yeah, and you're going to hear in this service how important this church is as a thin place where we are able to connect uh, with what really matters and support each other. It's up to you to helpfully let us know. We make mistakes, 10 of them. Um, I hope you'll be graceful with us as we try to care for each other as we move forward during the COVID time. We're not thrilled about uh, Chad's beautiful behind you, this camera there, but we're not thrilled about doing it this way, but we love that we're able to connect with you wherever you are. Uh, the last one is risk. I don't know, every day seems like a risk. <laughs> <laughs> Every day feels like a risk. Well, at the board meeting, we talked a lot about risk this week with David Keegan and exactly what it means. It's really confusing for our congregation to see other churches going back to church, settling in and things like that. But we were the, one of the very first ones to, to close because of the risk of this building and the risk of the vast number of people in this building is an issue. And we, are, we talked about risk and we're trying to mitigate exactly what we can do to, to, to keep going and make the best decisions going possible. So um, Yeah, and we'll be reporting to you as we move forward. Your board met for two hours this week online. Uh, they physically have never met each other, but here we are meeting, <laughs> uh, talking about risk, talking about uh, a response to the community, as well as uh, looking at a book uh, that talks about thriving churches. So your board continues to do its work as the many meetings all week long. So it's risky business. Uh, and we thank, the, thank people for showing up and uh, when, when they leave the meeting, push that red button. We, we know that our hearts and, uh, and prayers go with each and every one of us. So. And if you've gotten through all these announcements, thank you. Yeah, that's a risk. <laughs> okay, we're so glad you're here. Uh, we are going to install mute buttons in the pews uh, so that when we come back into this place, you can mute whoever's at the front whenever you want. Of course, a little red flag's gonna pop up and we're gonna know you anyway. But uh, we're so glad you joined us today and we trust that the Spirit will walk with you and I in the journey ahead. Happy Sunday. Happy Sunday. Good morning. I'm Keith Murray, your affirming coordinator here on the beautiful Treaty 7 territory with your affirming dog, Dolly. Hi, Dolly. And we're so excited to welcome you to worship this morning. Um, Hillhurst United Church is situated in Treaty 7 territory along the Bow River, and it's at the convergence of the Bow and Elbow Rivers that settlers came and named this place Calgary many years ago. But this name goes, uh, this area goes by many names. And um, the names that the uh, Nisitapi people referred to, which coincidentally means elbow, um, was Mokinsis. The Ayarhe Nakoda people also had a word for this area, Winchishpa, which guess what, means elbow. And the uh, Sutina people also have a name for this place called Kusisa. And guess what? It means elbow. So here we are, converging at this beautiful place. And for those of you from other areas, welcome to us virtually online. Uh, take a moment, if you like, to acknowledge in the chat, if you're watching on YouTube, the territory where you're coming from. Um, because that's the spirit of who we are at Hillhurst. We acknowledge the harms that the church and settlers and colonization had done in, in invoking a genocide on the first peoples here. And part of what it means to be treaty people in the, is to honor the treaties that we signed all those years ago in the spirit of good kinship with all of our relations on this land. And so one of the ways that we do that is by acknowledging the land, but there are many other ways and you can um, participate right now in 40 days of engagement with anti-racism with the United Church of Canada. Go to hellhurstunited.life and you can find out more information about that. You can sign up for some live events. You can watch recordings of past uh, teachings in the last few weeks. And um, go on Facebook in the hub and you can engage in a conversation about what we're learning. Um, you know, one of the things that um, was shared earlier about being an anti-racist disciple by Paul Douglas Walfell was this idea that, you know, we are often so hurried to get to the end goal that we just want to do the workshop and be done with it. Um, and that's not how you have a relationship. That's not how we be treaty people. Or be a disciple. Being a disciple means being committed, 
like John talked about last week, being dedicated, ongoing to each other. So it's not too late to join in the conversation. So go to hellisunited.life, participate in some of the events there. And another way that you can participate is coming up this Wednesday night, November 3rd at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Tony Snow from the Chinook Winds region is leading a conversation and around a movie. We're going to be watching a film um, called End of the Line. The Woman of Standing Rock. And it tells the story of the women who've been risking their lives to defend the land and the waters from the Dakota pipeline that would cross their territory. You know, it's a contentious conversation, but it's a very important one that we have. And you can join in the conversation and learn from some of the water and land defenders in this region. And it's so important that you do that. So please uh, go online to hillhurstunited.life to find out about that event. Uh, and many of the other offerings we have going on. Because this is the spirit of being Hillhurst, of being treaty people. And as a community that involves and includes everyone, we're a community that not only honors the nationality, the indigenous or non-indigenous status, um, your race or ethnicity, we're a community that values the sacred worth of everyone, whatever your gender or sexual orientation, your mental or physical health status or your economic status. We are an affirming community of faith that means whoever you are, wherever you're at, you're a part of us. So we're so glad you're joining us on the journey this morning. And let's walk together in this beautiful territory, whether online or in person, with your dog or your friends or by yourself. Know that you're not alone and we walk this walk together. Have a great Sunday and it's so good to be with you this morning. Happy Sunday. This is the day that God has made We will rejoice and be glad This is the day that God has made We will rejoice and be glad Sing it As we continue our worship, uh, and in fact, the seven day of work of our church, we're aware that uh, on this hero's journey, we're thinking about and reflecting on heart today. You'll hear later in the sermon that God's job is to hatch our heart, to break them open so that the spirit can get in and lead us on our journey. And so our prayer this day uh, comes aware that some people's hearts have been broken this week with news of illness or loss or death. Uh, some have been hardened by difficulty and frustration and they feel like their heart is hard. And others feel that their heart is gently opening, uh, a cracking opening, if you will. And so as we come, prayer is one way which we open ourselves, hatch ourselves to be born anew. I invite you to hear these words of old as we pray together. God, may our hearts Beat with yours. Give us pure hearts that we may see you. Give us humble hearts that we may hear you. Give us hearts of love that we may serve you. Give us hearts of faith that we may abide in you. Open our hearts, open our minds, open our bodies 
that we may be born anew this day. In silence, we offer our own words. Again, later in the service, you're going to hear about how the church can be a thin place, a place where heaven and earth come together, not literally, but metaphorically, where we step into the unity of all that is, where we begin to see God is not beyond us, but within us and around us and indeed everywhere. And the message of the thin place of scripture is this, we are loved, forgiven, and set free. Our task is to hear those words. We are loved, we are forgiven, and we are set free. And it is those words that lift us up, brush us off, and send us on our way. We do so with deep gratitude for the God who loves us, body, mind, and spirit, dedicated to us and our journey. Thanks be to God. Amen. This church is in such an important place We've been rolling through this COVID time for almost two years. And it's been a place that people have come to, sometimes physically, outside, online. And it has been a place that's been open seven days a week. And it's because we have been open, we are fully aware that hearts and minds have been transformed. And it's because of the gifts that you give that allow this work to take place seven days a week. It's not the amount, it's the intent. And we trust that you're able to offer your gift, which is a simple way of saying thank you. As you open your heart this day, may the Spirit welcome you, receive you, invite you to life. Our offering will now be received.
This morning we have a story from the book of John. John 3, 1 to 15. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. And Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. And Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can anyone enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? And Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you don't, do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. May these words of old speak to us today. What do Harry Potter, Katniss Everdeen, and Frodo all have in common with the heroes of ancient myths? What if I told you they are all variants of the same hero? Do you believe that? Joseph Campbell did. He studied myths from all over the world and published a book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces, retelling dozens of stories and explaining how each represents the monomyth or hero's journey. So what is the hero's journey? Think of it as a cycle. The journey begins and ends in the hero's ordinary world, but the quest passes through an unfamiliar, special world. Along the way, there are some key events. Think about your favorite book or movie. Does it follow this pattern? Status quo, that's where we start. One o'clock, call to adventure. The hero receives a mysterious message, an invitation, a challenge. Two o'clock, assistance. The hero needs some help, probably from someone older, wiser. Three o'clock, departure. The hero crosses the threshold from his normal, safe home and enters the special world and adventure. We're not in Kansas anymore. Four o'clock, trials. Being a hero is hard work. Our hero solves a riddle, slays a monster, escapes from a trap. Five o'clock, approach. It's time to face the biggest ordeal, the hero's worst fear. Six o'clock, crisis. This is the hero's darkest hour. He faces death and possibly even dies, only to be reborn. Seven o'clock, treasure. As a result, the hero claims some treasure, special recognition or power. Eight o'clock, result. This can vary between stories. Do the monsters bow down before the hero or do they chase him as he flees from the special world? Nine o'clock, return. After all that adventure, the hero returns to his ordinary world. 10 o'clock, new life. This quest has changed the hero. He has outgrown his old life. 11 o'clock, resolution. All the tangled plot lines get straightened out. 12 o'clock, status quo, but upgraded to a new level. Nothing is quite the same once you're a hero. Many popular books and movies follow this ancient formula pretty closely, but let's see how well The Hunger Games fits the hero's journey template. When does Katniss Everdeen hear a call to adventure that gets the story moving? When her sister's name is called from the lottery? How about assistance? Is anyone going to help her on her adventure? Hamish, 
What about departure? Does she leave her ordinary world? She gets on a train to the capital. Okay, so you get the idea. What do you have in common with Harry Potter, Katniss Everdeen, and Frodo? This sermon today, uh, you know, there's a book called Good to Great. I feel like this sermon's good, uh, but it could be great. Uh, today's Thursday, and uh, probably by Sunday, it could be great if I had time to finish it off. But I'm going to entrust that to you, that in the reflection on heroes, uh, you, your mind daydreams and you wander. And in that daydreaming and wandering, uh, the sermon comes from good to great. Uh, please pray with me. Spirit, we breathe. We breathe deeply. We give thanks for this moment in time, a Sunday morning, a Monday evening, a middle of the night on Wednesday, a chance to pause and reflect and be in the thin place of worship. May we have eyes to see and hearts to hear and know your love and grace as we journey. Be with us, we pray. Amen. So tonight is Halloween, uh, the 31st of October, the night of costumes, superheroes, and masks. A time of superheroes, robes, and masks. Kind of sounds like every day in 2021. Who would have thought that uh, heroes, capes, masks would be part of our everyday experience? One newspaper said this week about the hero in 2021. Out go the capes and tights and superpowers. In comes the surgical mask, the price tag gun, and the virtual classroom. Yes, as people come to our doors tonight, inevitably there will be superheroes who will be ringing the door, stepping back and receiving a trick and or a treat. Heroes. I've been thinking lots about heroes lately, and during this COVID time, have we not all seen or heard or been inspired by everyday heroes? But last Sunday, we looked at a book called Dedicated by Pete Davis, a book I've come to love. It's called Dedicated, The Case for Commitment in an Age of Infinite Browsing. And in that book, he talks about long haul heroes, people who have committed and been dedicated to the long haul. And it's easy to think about superheroes we might have. As a kid, I would think of Russ Jackson and the Ottawa Rough Riders. Check him out. He was my hero quarterback. I would be on the front lawn throwing the football as far as I could, just like Russ Jackson. But we also in our media have people who would be long haul heroes. People like Martin Luther King or Rosa Parks or Mr. Rogers or Greta Thunberg. These are long haul heroes, Pete Davis calls us to look at, who committed to the long haul, to the hero's journey, and they're called long haul heroes. So we've been thinking over the next four weeks about the hero's journey. We began spiritual nurture finally this fall. It was so awesome to see over 50 faces on a screen, people I kind of forgot about, people I've never met. There were people in our church. There were people from Ontario who've never been in our church but found us online. There were people from BC who used to be in our church. By 7, 10 p.m., I was totally filled up and energized just by seeing the heroes on the screen at our spiritual nurture. You know, it's been a, an amazing time to consider heroes during COVID. Do you remember way back in March when people banged pots and sang songs from their balcony, the, the heroes that were everyday heroes, the people who have been online watching and learning and teaching classrooms? All kinds of heroes began the COVID story. And then of late, that's been challenged as we're all weary and stressed and anxious by the length of this COVID journey. But hero has been core at this experience that lifts us along. Now, I'm fully aware that we're taking a rip off the hero's journey of Joseph Campbell, who wrote The Hero of a Thousand Faces. But what he's trying to do is get us to look at the hero's journey. The metaphor is archetypal. 
It crosses all religions and cultures and traditions. And the pattern of the hero's journey is part of every movie or epic story or book or yes, even religions. The myth doesn't mean it's false. It means it's actually centrally true. And in his book and in the video, which you saw a few moments ago, the hero's journey is laid out for us. It's summarized in a sense with a sense that someone is called away from the familiar. They're assisted by a friend or a helper. There's a battle or conflict of some, time, of some kind. There's death and loss and eventually rebirth and return being born anew in a new way. This meta pattern is part of all of these movies, books, stories, and yes, your life and mine, if we pay attention and consider our own heroic journey. Now, I just gotta say that this pattern, this hero's journey is part of many ways of looking at institutions and people uh, and psychology. You'll know it in the Christian tradition of life, death and resurrection is a hero's journey or institutions that have order, disorder, and reorder, institutional change. Or psychologically, the first half of life, the transition and the shift to the second half of life. Or you might wanna even think about it, how COVID has worked. There was pre-COVID, COVID, we're in it, and we're awaiting post-COVID. The liminal space that we sit in is part of this journey. Why do I tell you this? It's because all of these patterns are part of our life and part of the hero's journey, but we're not always clearly seeing it. But there it is, the hero's journey and these different stages in our life story. The hero's journey is a pattern, a common pattern. The hero's journey is my story and yours. On Monday night, we began the session just with a very simple question. Who's a hero for you and why? Just listening to some of the responses that day, that evening inspired me as people reflected on who was a hero for them and why. Maybe you want to daydream right now about who has been a hero for you in your life and why and share it with someone else. We're looking at the word hero and breaking it apart, looking first at the H, hero and heart. And my good friend, Jane Croshaw, who is a tennis pro and a leadership coach who, who meets me on the paddle court at seven in the morning to play under the lights. Jane is someone who knows this hero's journey as a leadership coach. And she says, heart is at the central part of the hero's journey. Heart is there from beginning to end, she says. It is the heart and its vulnerability and its realness and its grit it is part of the journey from beginning to end. Jane says the heart is about aligning ourselves with our values and how we determine we are determined to live from them is our heart business. The hero's journey begins with heart because the heart is at the center of who we are. It is about moving us from selfishness to selflessness. And so the heart and hero is part of the journey for each and every one of us when we're aware. In the evening, I took a bit of time as she looked at, I'll call it the spiritual, and I took the religious aspect because I believe you gotta be spiritual and religious. The most important word is and, but religion has played with heart significantly. In the Bible, heart appears over a thousand times. And I don't mean the hallmark heart, the heart in scripture is the central place. It holds together the intellect, perception, emotion, and volition of a person. It is the center, the core of our truest self. And the job is, by the creator spirit, to hatch the heart. And so our heart is like an egg and it is cracked open by the spirit. And it is that cracking open that something new is born. And so the heart is central to the religious uh, journey. The heart is about dying to an old way and being reborn, rising in a new way. There are many stories in the scripture about what I would call the hatching of the heart or the hero's journey. 
And the one that came to mind to me this week is the story of Nicodemus that was read by Laurie a few moments ago. You got to understand this cool story about Nicodemus. Nicodemus, you see, is talked about three times in John's gospel. He's talked about as the one who first comes by night. Don't you love it? It's like he's, he's sneaking around and by night he comes. People, why did he come at night? Well, you see, he was a leader of the Jewish law, the Sanhedrin. And perhaps he didn't want to be seen by anyone as he was coming to knock on the door and engage in conversation with Jesus about the law. And so he comes by night and enters into the conversation you heard. Jesus essentially said to him, it's not about the law, it's about love. Later on, Nicodemus appears in, the, in John's gospel to be the one who defends Jesus, who says to them as the leader of the law, everyone has the right to be heard before they are judged. And they concede. And then the third time we hear about Nicodemus is at the death of Jesus. It's Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus who come with spices, very rich spices, to anoint the body of Jesus after his death. But what's central in this is this encounter with Jesus, where he is told by Jesus, it's not about the law, it's about love. It's not about your mind, it's about your heart. It's about being born anew. Now, Nicodemus debates, how can I go back in my mother's womb? And Jesus says, what I mean by this is you've got to be born from above. Or evangelical communities will often say, or be born again. I often respond when someone says to me, are you born again? I say, yes, I'm born again and again and again and again. Because the pattern of being born again or born anew is an ongoing hero's journey. We are many deaths and many rebirths in our journey. And the hero's journey is about being born again, about being born anew. It's about not being pure and selfish, but actually selfish at the end of our journey, where we are selfless for the other and for others in our common journey. So you see, on Monday night, we were about hero and heart and how they come together. And what's been amazing this past week is to be in conversations with people at different meetings or encounters to simply post them, who's a hero for you and why? And as you hear some of the responses, what amazes you is how the heart is central as, as people journey the hero's journey. Some examples. A woman in conversation I'd never met on Zoom said, I'll tell you who my hero is. It's the palliative care doctor who helped me and my husband in the final stages of life. She said their care for him and for her was essential in the final stages of life, the heart at work. Another said, my hero was my sponsor in my addiction recovery program, who always was there, who was always forgiving, always understanding, and who loved me to sobriety. Another said it was a friend from childhood who would text me and call me at times when I was low in my life and encourage me and remind me that I am a beautiful person that lifted me, and she's my hero. At our board meeting, a doctor in the community said, I'll tell you who is. For me, it's a, a mentor, medical friend of mine in Newfoundland who's he leading the whole healing process during COVID, whose humility and grace and intellect are shepherding people through a very difficult time. The combination of humility, grace, intellect, our heart, words, shepherding in this time. One named a minister who gave them perspective along the way. One named a grandparent who is a First Nations person whose wisdom sharing their traditions and rituals and people of people in their tribe is central to his young life now. Another woman mentioned her maternal grand, grandmother who, who came to Canada in the 1930s under very difficult circumstances. She was widowed at 33, had 10 of her own children under her care, and starts a new business, a clothing business. She says, I, as I wandered around Montreal and reflected on this person and what they did in such difficult and challenging times, she's an inspiration to me. One mentioned that 
It's the, it's the often silent person, an LGBTQ hero here in Calgary who suffered in jail years after homosexuality was, um, was set free as a way to live, but remained in prison despite this because of their cause. Another talked about nursing care people who, who help their visit their loved ones during COVID. And one mentioned a church community who gathers online and how important it is to see the faces of one another. You see, we have everyday heroes everywhere and they have journeyed and they've struggled and they have died and they have risen in a new way. And that is what the hero's journey is. I look back at a book that I read a long time ago, The Heart of Christianity by Marcus Borg. It was written in 1990, and Marcus Borg died a few years ago. Marcus Borg is the one that kept me in the church. I would have thrown in the towel a long, long time ago, but he used his wisdom in the Jesus Seminar, his intellect and his compassion to help me stay in the game because he is the one who kept me real and helped me to see the importance of the long haul of the metaphors that are so important in the religious journey. Anyway, in this book, as he looks at the centrality of scripture and tradition and faith, he has this beautiful understanding of the work of the spirit and says essentially, God's job is to hatch our heart. And our hearts are hatched, he says, when we step into and we're part of thin places. The thin places are those experiences that hatch our heart. He says poetry does it. Poetry can hatch and calm and inspire us. Music can make us weep and center into our deepest core and walk and run and dance anew. It's nature can be a thin place or the arts, anything that gets us into our truest self to hatch the heart and move us forward is a thin place. Well, one of the funny things he says in this book is that the church is a thin place. Think about it. The church, if you've been part of one, is a thin place because when we gather, there's an experience that cracks our heart open and we are changed. It might be in meeting a stranger, a conversation, a scripture passage, a sacrament, a sermon, a hymn, or the silence. All of these things that happen in the thin place of of worship, of church, are what hatch our heart open and we are transformed. That's why so many people will say, I come in empty and I leave filled up. It's because our hearts have been hatched, broken open, and we are born anew, born again, born from above in a new way. I want to end this sermon with two emails I received this week that speak perfectly to what I'm trying to say about the hero's journey, the heart, and thin places. The first email came and Anne shoved it off to me and we read it and we were delighted. It lifted us up in our journey. It begins like this. Good morning. As a member of another church in this city, I occasionally attended Remembrance Day and Christmas Eve service as a Hillhurst United Church. In February 11th, 2020, I came home from a volunteer shift at Foothills Medical Center to an email and voicemail from my partner. The email simply said, after 37 years of marriage, we're done. We're done. I couldn't face going to my own church and the questions people might raise, so I drove to Hillhurst. The message that day was from a woman who stood at the pulpit who had gone a similar situation that I was 25 years earlier. And then COVID closed churches. I continued to worship at this other church online, but six months ago, I was very lucky to move to Hillhurst. Six months ago, I tuned in to YouTube and your service. I want to tell you how meaningful this has been. I can still hear the loon's call from my summer sermon for the birds. I can remember the quote in the sermon by Parker Palmer about homelessness. It's posted on a blackboard on my wall. 
And just earlier this week, I was discussing the book Dedicated you spoke of last week, where you looked at the blocks we have the dedication, about regret, fear of missing out, and association. I shared these with a good friend and we had a rich conversation. All I need to tell you today is this, thank you. As we, and thank you to many others. I look forward to worshiping with you at Hillhurst in person someday. Do you see how this email speaks about the thin place where the heart is touched and open and transformed when we've gone through difficulty like that kind of break and loss and how these messages and participation in the thin place heals us and moves us along in the hero's journey. That's what Marcus Borg is saying in this book, the thin places matter. The last email I wanna share with you is a little bit longer, but it's so important because this congregant who's been here for quite some time shares vulnerably about her own hero's journey. Both of these people, by the way, have given me permission to read these. Here it goes. I have been immersed in a journey of grief these last few months. I whole, had a whole lot of loss all at once, more than I've experienced my whole life. A separation in my marriage, a physical injury immobilized me. I'm just getting back to some kind of normal. And then my child moved away to university and my dad died at the end of August. All of this loss at once, that's a lot of death. I have never really experienced grief. I now found myself reverting to the faith of my youth, the old songs we used to sing together, the images of God as Father, rock, and light. The hero's journey, she writes, the hero's journey for me is to look death in the face and come away in new life. I never would have asked for any of this but I am a different person than I was five months ago, and I wouldn't want the former me back. I wouldn't want the former me back. Continually facing death for, for me, which means hard emotions like shame, hate, anger, sadness, and grief has brought a depth I didn't know I had. A yearning for vulnerability, truth, and intimacy that I now seek in close conversations is very real. The truth is my new drug, speaking my truth, living my truth, and being true to my own story is what keeps me going. For example, my relationship that I was in was toxic, which is a code word I'm using because when I say the word abusive, I'm not always believed by other people, which is devastating to me. It was an emotionally manipulative and controlling situation for most of the, the decades of my marriage. Looking that fact in the face has taken years and being able to speak about it has happened only recently. But it's my truth and denying it only made me unhealthy and made the marriage a secret I had to hold on to alone. Facing the truth and looking for freedom has been a long, hard process, a journey. But because of the depth of the negative and hard feelings that I have to face and feel, the joys are also showing up in a depth I never expected. An amazing star show in the sky, a satisfying run, laughing with my kids, really good bread and butter, the kindness of humans. These are so much richer than I've ever been able to seek and the healing I feel now. New life has meant rewriting what I want and what my new family looks like. Brene Brown's work has meant a lot to me, rumbling with suck, being curious about the feelings I'm having and reckoning with the way things have to be now. All of this looking and searching and struggling and the hero's journey matters. Brene Brown said something had to die for forgiveness to happen. I'm still on that particular road and I'm putting ideas and hopes and the past experiences to death in order to move forward and forgive whatever that looks like. The healing is painful and I'm learning to swear more, but I actually wouldn't trade it for normalcy. I don't know how to grow when things are going well. So you see, I feel grateful 
actually grateful for my health, grateful for my kids, grateful for my well-being, grateful for food, friends that have rallied around me, for my mom, and grateful mostly for my faith and for the God who has wrapped her arms around me and rocked me in my tears many times in the past month. Grateful to the God, her arms wrapped around me and rocked me in my tears many times this past month. Isn't it amazing to see the testimony of people here the testimony of people who have experienced the thin place that touches and hatches their heart on the hero's journey and sends them off into the world anew. You see, the Christian journey is a hero's journey. The call of Jesus, the descent to the wilderness, the ministry of Jesus, the surrender of the cross, and the invitation to be born anew in the resurrection, all of this is the hero's journey. I'm alone with a few people in the thin place of this, your church, but we are together through this technology to know that we're not alone, to know that we are loved, forgiven, and set free. And as we journey, may she wrap her arms around us and hold us and rock us, laugh with us and weep with us and lift us to walk anew on our journey. Thanks be to God for this renewing, hatching love that lifts us to life. Amen.
That was so awesome, that uh, piece of music that fits with our theme of the heart and hero and journey and thin places. You know, as we step into this week and engage in conversation with others and ask them about who the heroes are, may you and I discover the hero within us as we journey. May the Spirit continually hatch our heart, break it open, that love and compassion, peace and justice be lived. And may you and I go knowing that we are loved, forgiven, and set free. In the name of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, Mother of us all. Amen.
steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning, new every morning. Great is God's faithfulness, O Lord. Great is your faithfulness. Steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. God's mercies never to an end. They are new every morning, new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, O Lord. Great is your faithfulness. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. God's mercies never come to an end. Faithfulness, O Lord, great is your faithfulness. What does the
steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning, new every morning. Great is God's faithfulness, O Lord. Great is your faithfulness. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. God's mercies never Mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning, new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, O oh Lord. Great is your faithfulness.